This is the first talk about somatosensory evoked potential in operative monitoring. It is intended for the Niklaus Children's Hospital Fellows. This talk will be conducted in a question and answer format. The first question is, the incidence of paraplegia in patients undergoing surgery on the descending aorta approaches what percent? A, 10, B, 20, C, 30, D, 40. Early in the report on the standard recommendations for intraoperative monitoring of somatosensory evoked potentials, the risk of a spinal cord damage in three different surgical interventions are listed. For scoliosis surgery, the risk is 0.5 to 1.6%. For a spinal cord tumor decompression, the risk is 20%. And for surgery involving the descending aorta, the risk of paraplegia approaches 40%. So the answer to this question is D. Next question. The posterior spinal artery most frequent origin is A. The vertebral arteries B. The posterior inferior cerebral arteries C. The basilary artery D. None of the above. In this figure, you can see a version of the spinal cord vascularization. You can see that the anterior spinal artery here indicated in the enclosed figure most of the time arises from the vertebral artery. You can also see back in the large figure that the two posterior spinal arteries arise most often from the pica, but in about 25% of the time they arise from the vertebral arteries. So the answer to this question is B. Next question. The posterior and anterior radicular arteries arise from the dash branch of the dorsal branch of the posterior intercostal artery. A, spinal, B, intercostal, C, anterior, D, none of the above. The posterior radicular arteries supply the ipsilateral posterior spinal artery, whereas the anterior radicular artery supplies the anterior spinal artery. The anterior radicular artery is an offshoot of the spinal branch which arises from the dorsal branch of the posterior intercostal artery. So the answer to this question is A. Next question. The arterial ring around the spinal cord is called the A. Vasocoronal artery B. Segmental artery C. Radicular artery D. None of the above. The right posterior intercostal artery, which is longer than the left, arise, both of them, from the dorsal facet of the aorta. In this drawing, from the dorsal thoracic artery, these arteries ultimately feed the anterior and posterior spinal arteries. At the level of the spinal cord, which I have now represented in the enclosed figure, 
you can see the penetrating arteries arising in this case from the posterior spinal artery on the right and the sulcar artery arising from the midline anterior spinal artery and you can also see the vasocoronal arteries these arteries wrap around the cord and provide additional short penetrating arteries to irrigate the spinal cord so the answer to this question is a next question the dorsal branch of the posterior intercostal artery is also called the segmental medullary artery a true b false most version of the spinal cord vasculature nomenclature refers to the artery exiting the aorta towards the spinal cord as the posterior intercostal artery as pointed out before and here by the arrow and again here in the smaller figure you can see that there are different versions as to what happens after the posterior intercostal artery as you can see in the larger figure the first branch that comes off the posterior intercostal artery is simply called the dorsal branch which shortly after gives off another branch that is called the spinal branch from which the anterior and posterior radicular arteries arise yet in another version the branch that comes out of the posterior intercostal artery is called the segmental spinal artery instead of the dorsal branch of the posterior intercostal artery and the branches that connect directly to the anterior spinal artery are called segmented medullary arteries instead of spinal branches while those that reach the spine hogging the roots and rootlets are either called posterior radicular arteries or anterior radicular arteries depending which way they go anteriorly or posteriorly so the answer to this question is b next question which of the following statements is not true regarding the artery of adam kiewitz a it provides most of the irrigation of the low thoracic spine b it arises from a posterior intercostal artery t9 to t12 c it arises directly from the descending aorta at the level of t9 to t12 b it is named after a polish pathologist this frame shows a drawing that represents the relation between the thoracic aorta and the spinal cord and it also has the photograph of dr adamkowicz this frame was taken out of a neurosurgical journal that is called the neurosurgical forum In this frame I have colored the left posterior intercostal artery corresponding to T10 and T11 and their anterior and posterior radicular arteries as you can see. The arrow in this figure indicates the anterior radicular artery corresponding to T10. And in this frame the arrow indicates the anterior radicular artery corresponding to T11. As you can see just below the T10 radicular artery the arrow indicates another artery which I have now colored this is the artery of Adamkowicz which is nothing more or less than an anterior large that is the largest segmental artery as you can see in this frame it is called the great anterior segmental artery the reason the term anterior is there is because some authors believe that there's also some arteries that should be named posterior segmental medullary arteries
because they connect to the posterior spinal arteries without following the roots or rootlets. The artery of Adamco which arises from one of the posterior intercostal arteries and it was described by Adankowicz, who was a Polish pathologist. In this case, as you can see, the artery of Adankowicz arises from T11, posterior intercostal artery, but in other individual, it may arise from as low as T9 or as high as T12. So, the answer to this question is C. Next question, which spinal cord segment is most vulnerable to ischemia injury? A, low cervical spine, B, mid thoracic spine, C, mid cervical spine, D, low thoracic spine. Take a few seconds, stop the video if you have to, so you can get oriented in this figure because the next frame will show you a very cartoonish representation of spinal cord irrigation that it would be better understood if you have a good concept of this figure. As I just mentioned, this is certainly a more schematic representation of the spinal cord vasculature. I put this figure here to emphasize a few important points about spinal cord circulation. The first point is that the junction of the anterior segmental medullary arteries and the anterior radicular arteries with the anterior spinal artery and all the junctions between the posterior medullary segmental arteries and posterior radicular arteries with the posterior spinal artery have a delta configuration with blood moving in opposite directions once the blood reaches the spinal arteries. And at other spinal cord segments, the junction between the anterior segmental medullary artery and the anterior radicular arteries with the anterior spinal artery have a double delta circulation. Regardless of the type of junction, blood in the spinal arteries flow in both directions. These directions end up weakening the force of the current in the spinal arteries, which is in the mid thoracic region. So the answer to this question is B. Next question. Which of the following spinal cord tracts is not supplied by the anterior spinal artery? A. Ventrospinous cerebellar tract. B. Dorsal spinal cerebellar tract. C. Spinal reticular tract. D. Cuneatus fasciculus. This drawing represents a transverse spinal cord cut high in the cervical region. The spinal cord tracts and fascicles differ in size and content at different levels of the spine. The irrigation nonetheless is the same at all levels. There is a posterior spinal artery territory, an anterior spinal artery territory, and a peripheral artery territory. The peripheral artery territory consists of a thin rim of tissue all around the spinal cord. Mainly, the irrigation is carried out by penetrating arteries of the vasocoronal artery. The posterior spinal artery territory consists of a relatively small area in the dorsal spine irrigated by the deep penetrating vessels from the posterior spinal arteries. In this area, we only find sensory elements. These elements are the gracialis fascicle and 
the cuneatus fascicle. As you know, the fibers arising in the sacral region occupy the most medial segments. More laterally, we find the lumbar fibers. Then, in the cuneatus fascicle, we have the thoracic fibers and then the cervical fibers. Not a part of the posterior column, but also irrigated by the posterior spinal arteries, we have the dorsolateral tract of Lissauer. The anterior circulation territory is certainly more extensive. It is mainly irrigated by the sulcal artery arising directly from the anterior spinal artery. Many tracts are in this zone. Lateral to the dorsolateral tract of Lysaur, we find the rostral spinocerebellar tract. The rostral spinocerebellar tract brings information to the cerebellum from the Golgi tendon organs and pressure receptors. This tract does not decussate according to Carpenter's Neuroanatomy, but in the book Essential of Clinical Neuroanatomy by Mainter and Gans, they are reported to decussate. The rostral spinocerebellar tract brings information from the upper body, specifically from the arms. It originates in the ventral horns, enters the cerebellum through the inferior peduncle and superior peduncle according to Carpenter, but according to Master and Gans, they only come into the cerebellum through the superior peduncle and terminates at the cerebellar cortex. Still lateral to the rostral spinocerebellar tract, we find the posterior spinocerebellar tract. The posterior or dorsal spinocerebellar tract carries information from muscle spindles and joint receptors. This tract does not decussate, carries information from the lower half of the body. It originates in the Clark nucleus, which extends from L2 to T1 in the intermediate section of the spinal gray and receives fibers from the dorsal ganglia after these fibers climb in the gracialis fascicle. The posterior spinocerebellar tract enters the cerebellum through the inferior peduncle to end at the vestigial nucleus, the interposed nucleus, and the cerebellar cortex. Anterior to the posterior dorsal spinocerebellar tract, there is the anterior spinocerebellar tract. The anterior spinocerebellar tract carries information generated at the Golgi tendon organs and pressure receptors. It decussates. It carries information from the lower half of the body, primarily the legs. It originates in the ventral horn of the spinal cord great matter. It is a track that most agree goes to the cerebellum through the superior peduncle to end up in the cortex. The next track I like to mention is probably the most talked about sensory track of the lot. I am referring to the lateral spinothalamic track. This track is regionalized as follows. The cervical fibers are most medial, then comes the thoracic fibers, 
then the lumbar, and then the sacral fibers. I have now introduced the anterior or ventral spinothalamic tract. Next, I will introduce three tracts that end up in nuclei located in the brainstem. These tracts are the spino olivary tract, the spinotectal tract, and the spinoreticular tract. On the other side, I will represent motor fibers. Starting with the anterior corticospinal tract, this is the name given to a few bunch of corticospinal motor fibers that do not cross the midline in the medulla, but ultimately do so close to their intended anterior horn motor cells. Anterior to it, we have the tectospinal tract, Next, the vestibulospinal tract. Next, the olivospinal tract. Then, the anterior reticulospinal tract. Then, the lateral reticular tract. Another motor tract is the rubrospinal tract. And the mighty lateral corticospinal tract with the cervical fiber most medially, followed by the thoracic fibers, then the lumbar, and most laterally, the sacral fibers. Medial to the lateral corticospinal tract, we have the last but not least motor tract that I will mention. This is the hypothalamic spinal tract. So the answer to this question is D. Next question, which of the following is not true? A. Chassis leakage should be less than 100 microamps. B. Elements in direct connection with humans should be less than 10 microamps. C. Grounding should ensure that no voltage over 100 millivolts RMS across an impedance of a thousand ohm is present in any machine element. D, a line isolated monitor device should be used all the time. The American Clinical Neurophysiologic Society recommends that any machine used for interoperative monitoring should adhere to a very strict safety standard. Chassis leakage should be less than 100 microamps any wire intended to be connected to a patient should be less than 10 microamps. And grounding should ensure that no voltage above 20 millivolts RMS is present across an impedance of 1000 ohms. This should be true regardless of where or which element of the machine is measured. Another important point made in the recommendation is that an, an isolated monitor device should always be used in the OR. So the answer to this question is C. Next question. A repetition rate of dash per second is suggested when obtaining SSCP for neurophysiologic interoperative monitoring. A, 2 to 8, B, 12 to 18, C, 22 to 30, D, 1 to 2. The slower the repetition rate, the higher amplitude of the potential being generated. If we take the amplitude of a wave generated by a stimulus given, at a rate of 1.1 per second as having an amplitude of 100% where we to increase the stimulus rate to 15.1 the amplitude would significantly drop. 
but on the other hand, the slower the stimulus rate, the longer it takes to collect actual information. So we must reach a happy compromise between amplitude of the potential and time of acquisition. A rather effective compromise is to use about 5.1 stimulation per second. The reason for the 0.1 is to avoid a number that is a multiple of 60, since the current that we use in the United States is 60 Hz. Some authors do suggest to use a stimulus rate in the lower extremity of 5.1 to get the maximal benefit of amplitude. And since potential from the upper extremities tend to be of higher amplitude, to sacrifice the stimulus amplitude for a speed in the upper extremity by stimulating at a rate of 8.1 per second. Yet other authors suggest a rate of 2.1 per second for the legs and 5.7 for the arms. So the answer to this question is A. Next question. Monophasic rectangular pulses of dash microsecond duration and dash milliamps intensity are recommended for peripheral nerve stimulation. A. 100 to 300 space 30 to 40 B. 500 to 600 space 30 to 40 C. 100 to 200 space 50 to 70 D. 200 to 800 space 10 to 70 the duration of the stimulus pulse should be from 100 to 300 microseconds. The intensity should be between 30 and 40 milliamps, unless a reason is present, such as limb edema, peripheral neuropathy, or anatomical variant that demand using a higher stimulus intensity. Some books, especially looters, mention the possibility of raising the stimulus intensity up to 80 to 90 milliamps. So the answer to this question is A. Next question. Which of the following is not a cause of ineffective stimulation? A. Dislodgement of stimulation electrodes. B. Edema around the stimulating area. C. High impedance electrode. D. Too low low frequency filter. The charging devices such as stimulators have an anode prong, usually represented by an open circle or a white or red circle. A stimulator also have a cathode prong, usually represented by a solid circle or a black circle. In this figure, I have used gray instead of black to create contrast since the background I'm using is black. The distance between the anode and the cathode should be about 2.5 to 3 centimeters. In theory, either the node discharges positive charges that travel to the cathode, or the cathode discharges negative charges that travel to the anode. Be it as it may, once the stimulator is on, a depolarization will occur in the axon under the cathode, represented here by the green arrows. This will be captured by the recording device, as you can see, creating a potential. Were we to crush the axon under the anode, the potential will still be generated once we put the stimulator on. Were we to crush the axon under the cathode, no potential would be generated. Regardless of the position of the electrodes in relation to the recording device, this proof that it is under the cathode that axons depolarize and it is important to notice that I am referring to 
axon depolarizing. Failure to generate also occurs if the electrodes are dislodged from the surface of the area that it intends to stimulate in air is a very poor conductor of electricity. In the case of a short circuitry created between the prongs, for example, as a result of water under both prongs, and if very high impedance is present between the area being stimulated and the prongs. Problems with the machine can also cause problems with the stimulation. So the answer to this question is D. Next question. Generally, during interoperative recording, dash repetitions are needed to achieve an interpretable and reproductible scalp somatosensory evoke potential. A. 250 to 1000. B. 1000 to 2000. 3. 2000 to 3000. D. 3000 to 4000. Scalp recorded potentials following risk stimulation take about 250 to 1000 repetitions but fewer repetitions let's say 200 will do if the potential is clear and consistent so the answer to this question is a next question which of the following is not a cause for ineffective recording a dislodgement of the stimulation electrodes b surgical equipment usage D. Decreasing the low frequency filter. D. Adding 60 Hz filter. The recommended filter for interoperative monitoring varies. The Academy recommends a low frequency filter of 30 Hz and a high frequency filter of 1000 Hz. Filter setting should not be changed during a study. If they are changed, we need to obtain new baseline in order to re-establish them. Decreasing the low frequency filter increases the amount of wave contributing to the ultimate signal, thus increases the amplitude of the wave. In this frame, I have gone back to the Academy's recommended filter settings for interoperative somatosensory evoke potential monitoring. As you can see, the notch filter is not being used. Addition of the notch filter will decrease the amount of waves contributing to the signal, thus decreasing the amplitude of the signal. Adding the notch filter may lead to an ineffective recording and is not recommended. Another condition that can lead to ineffective recording is subdural air. The possibility should be considered if the dura is open during surgery and the patient is in a sitting position. You can see in this frame ulnar somatosensory evoke potentials on top and tibial somatosensory evoke potentials below. In the right ulnar you see a drop in the potentials amplitude between 1230 and 110. In the left ulnar, you can see a drop between 115 and 145. In the right tibial, you can see a drop between 1255 and 125. And in the left tibia, you can see a minimal drop, probably of no clinical significance, between 1245 and 1. Now I have introduced a post-operative CT which as you can see reveal an increased amount of air between the scalp and the brain. This CT was done supine and therefore you see the air in the upper part but while the patient is sitting the air would actually block the activity of the brain 
from reaching the scalp electrodes. The SCP finding, as the one we just seen, if not recognized, could be taken as a sign of a spinal cord pathology. For this reason, ineffective recording has to be considered after any time an unexplained change in potentials occur while the patient is undergoing surgery. So the answer to this question is C. Next question. The analysis time should be at least dash the usual latency of the last wave of interest a twice b thrice c four times d six times this table has the typical montage used for interoperative media nursomatosensory potential at many institutions notice that most derivation use the uninvolved contralateral air point as a reference except in the first derivation, this derivation has two relatively close electrodes. This is done to forego capturing widely distributed potentials such as P13, 14, and N18. Regardless of the derivation use, the last potential of interest is P24. This is so because the amplitude of N20 is measured from the peak of N20 to P24. You can see in this frame that in this equipment the potentials are not given as N20 and P24 but as N19 and P23. The analysis time in this frame, as you can see, is 50 milliseconds. So regardless of the derivation used, the analysis time for upper extremity somatosensory evoke potential should be 40 to 50 milliseconds. And for the lower extremity, from 80 to 100 milliseconds, which represents twice the latency of the last potential of interest. So the answer to this question is A. Next question. Which of the following steps do not decrease a stimulus artifact? A. Decrease the high frequency filter. B. Split the low frequency filter direction. C. Place more than one ground to a somatosensory evoke potential machine. D. Enable trigger delay option. After selecting the position of the cathode, if a stimulus artifact is dis distorting the recording, we should follow a given number of steps. The first step is to rotate the anode without moving the cathode. If the artifact persists, the next step will be to reduce the stimulus intensity and also the duration if necessary. If the artifact persists, move the cathode along the nerve more distally, thus increasing the distance between the cathode and the recording electrodes and the ground. If artifact persists, move the cathode to the initial position and move the ground electrode further from the stimulator. If it persists, bring the ground back to where it was, and if the machine has an option for multiple grounds, becoming one ground in the machine, use it. If artifacts persist, or if multiple ground options are not available in the machine, increase the size of the ground by using a larger electrode. If artifact persists, decrease the low frequency filter. If persists and if available, make sure that the artifact removal option in the computer screen is enabled. 
If you persist, enable the split filter option. And if still continues, enable the trigger hold off option. In the mother machine, these options appear as a drop down window and some machines have some of these options available and others do not. The older machine had all of these options represented in the front by different knobs that you can actually move around and enable them or suppress them uh, relatively easily. The trigger hold off function extends the time between a stimulation and, re and recording by few microseconds, not enough to alter the rate of a stimulation. This is a representation of a trigger hold off option in an all somatosensory evoke potential machine. The arrow indicates the trigger hold off period, which spans from the beginning. of the sweep to the beginning of the next sweep, including a portion that is called the trace blanking period. During that period, the data is rejected and the stimulus is not allowed to go into the machine in order for it to be integrated in the data numbers. When the trigger hold off bottom is increased, or in the newer machine enable, the hold off period is extended by increasing the blanking period, that is the time after the stimulus that the data is not collected. So the answer to this question is A, decrease the high frequency filter. Next question, halothen, efferane, and isoflurane halogen hydrocarbon inhalation agents at normal concentration will produce A, increased cortical latencies, B, reduced cortical potential amplitudes, C, prolonged central conduction time, D, all of the above. Drugs used during anesthesia can be artificially divided as anesthetic in neuromuscular blockers. Neuromuscular blockers are good for somatosensory work potentials, but bad for muscle evoke potentials. Anesthetic agents can be further divided in two groups, inhalational and intravenous. Inhalational anesthetics include the halothen family and nitrous oxide. The intravenous family includes propofol, which is probably the most widely used intravenous anesthetics, opioids such as fentanyl, and sedative. Although sedatives are not anesthetics, we will consider them in this group because they share the, their actions upon somatosensory work potentials with propofol and opioids. Some anesthetics at regular doses have an effect on cortical N20 and P37 and on subcortical potentials. The peripheral system is not affected by anesthetics, save for muscle relaxants that by decreasing artifact may increase the visibility of the wave of interest. Halogenated gases increase latency and decrease amplitude of cortical potentials and also produce minimal changes in subcortical potential. Isofluorine one of the anesthetics I just mentioned has the weakest effects on cortical activity and cortical potentials, but still 
it does have an effect on it. This figure shows the result of increasing inhaled halogen gases upon lower extremity cortical potentials. The arrow points to the amount of fluorine concentration. Notice that the site of P37 at baseline is relatively high and compare it with the amplitude of the same wave when the concentration is increased. In this new frame, you can see the relation between anesthetic concentration and median nerve somatosensory evoked potential latencies. Notice that little to no prolongation in peripheral conduction is present. But the significant latency prolongation that occurs when central conduction is involved and measured. It is significant that the latency prolongation that occurs when central conduction is involved does not occur immediately. It will occur in about 10 to 15 minutes after the changes are made. So, cortical potentials will sometimes take 10 to 20 minutes to change based on the concentration of anesthetics being inhaled, whereas, as you recall, most of the time, subcortical potentials are not influenced by anesthetics. In addition to halogen Nated gases. Nitrous oxide produces no change in latency, but it may produce a drop in amplitude of the cortical potential. Nitrous oxide produces no significant change in the subcortical potentials. Propofol causes minimal changes in cortical and subcortical potentials. Same as opioids and benzodiazepines. Muscle relaxant, as we previously stated, by decreasing muscle artifact may produce an increase in amplitude, but do not alter latency. So the answer to this question is D. Next question. Which of the following drugs enhances the amplitude of cortical somatosensory evoked potentials? A. Etomidate. B. Catamine. C both D neither. Both etomidate and catamine are short acting intravenous anesthetics. They have been reported to enhance the amplitude of cortical potentials. So the answer to this question is C. Next question. Peripheral nerve conduction slows down and compound nerve action potential drops steadily as temperature decreases. A true, B false. This figure represents the central and peripheral nervous system. This figure that I have just introduced represents only the peripheral nervous system. And on the other side, the figure represents only the central nervous system. I will first talk about the effect of temperature on the peripheral nervous system. This is a representation of a nerve, a muscle, and its synapse. That is the, the connection between the nerve and the muscle. Nerve action potential, amplitude, and duration will increase at lower temperatures, as you can see in this frame. Further decrease in temperature to very low levels at some point have the opposite effect. A similar decrease in temperature 
will also increase the amplitude and duration of the compound muscle action potential, but to a much lesser degree. Now, if we continue to lower the temperature, that is, if we go, as you can see in this frame, down to 23.3 centigrade, the compound action poten potential will also increase significantly. In this frame, I am representing the peripheral nervous system changes in relation to conduction and amplitude by lowering body temperature. At 32 degrees centigrade, control studies have provided normal values of nerve conduction velocity and compound action potential. If in the same individual the temperature is lowered to 21 centigrade, conduction drops but amplitude increases. By the time the temperature is decreased to 17, both conduction velocity becomes prolonged and amplitude drops. At 13 degrees centigrade, the drop in velocity and amplitude is even more significant. So the answer to this question is false. Next question. Central nervous system conduction slows down and compound nerve action potential drops as temperature decreases. A true, B false. Central nervous system potentials also change with temperature. Let's say that if we consider that at 32 degrees centigrade both somatosensory work potential center conduction and amplitude are normal. As the temperature goes down, conduction velocity steadily becomes more prolonged. The amplitude also tends to go down as the temperature goes down. But it is unclear if initially there is a slight increase in amplitude of central potential as the temperature starts dropping. So the answer to this question is true. Next question. Central conduction involving synaptic transmission is more vulnerable to hypoxia and low temperature than central conduction that does not involve synaptic transmission. A true, B false. Central conduction not involving synaptic transmission, let's say the conduction velocity from the lumbar potential to the cervical spine potential behaves differently than when the conduction time involves synaptic transmission. Let's say from N13 uh, to N20. A progressive drop in oxygenation from normal oxygenation to significant hypoxygenation decreases conduction more so if synaptic transmission is involved than if it is not. A progressive drop in temperature will also slow conduction more so if synaptic transmission is involved than if it is not. So the answer to this question is true. Next question. Which of the following potentials is more likely to disappear first during hypothermia induction? A, N18, B, N20, C, N13, D, EP. Evoke potentials react to dropping temperature differently based on the location of the structure generating it. Cortical potentials are gone when the temperature reaches 21 degrees centigrade. Subcortical potentials are still present at 21 degrees 
but are gone by 17 degrees centigrade. Cervical potentials have the same fate as subcortical potentials. So when performing somatosensory evoked potentials with body temperature down to 21 degrees centigrade, we will find P13, N18, and N13. Some explain this pattern by pointing out that the temperature in the body core, here indicated by bright red, is higher than the temperature in more peripherally located structures. In other words, if a central nervous system a structure generating a potential is closer to the midline, the temperature in that structure will be higher than the temperature will be more peripherally. So as you can see in this drawing, those regions that are closer to the midline have a potential at temperatures of 21 degrees centigrade whereas the cortical potential that is N20, P22, P27 and N30 will not be present at this temperature. So the answer to this question is B. Next question, which of the following evoked potential has the lowest amplitude? A. Auditory evoked potentials B. Somatosensory evoked potentials C. Visual evoked potentials D. EEG potentials In Beras, vertical divisions corresponds to 0 0.05 to 0 0.1 microvolts. The amplitude of wave 5, usually the tallest wave in the tracing, is between 0 0.1 to 0 0.5 microvolts. In somatosensory evoked potentials, vertical divisions are given in 0 0.5 microvolts with cortical potentials ranging from 2 to 10 microvolts. In visual evoked potentials, vertical divisions are set at 2 microvolts and P100 ranges from 2 to 5 microvolts. Medium EE activity is about 50 microvolts. So the answer to this question is A. Next question. In order to bring the signal to noise ratio to 2, if the desirable activity is 0 0.5 microvolts and 10 microvolts the background activity, how many repetitions do you need? A. 1200, B. 1600, C. 2000. D, 2400. The formula used to determine the number of sweeps or repetitions needed to improve a signal by a desirable amount is stated here. In the next few frames, I will use a paragraph that I read in an old grass manual to explain this formula. The formula states that the number of sweeps needed to improve the signal to noise ratio is equal to the noise divided by the signal multiplied by the desirable ratio to the second power. Based on a classical problem presented in the old monograph I just mentioned, I will talk to you about the form formula as it is reproduced here. Two is the desirable ratio and it can be presented as 2 over 1. The signal to noise ratio can be transferred to 
the other side of the equation by inverting its factor as I have done in this frame. For convenience sake, we can flip all factors without changing the value of the equation. So the square number of repetition is equal to the noise divided by the signal and multiplied by the desirable ratio. Now I have cleared the n from the square root by making the other side of the equation to the second power. So then by substituting the values, that is so substituting the values for the numbers presented in this problem, we can reach n as being 40 to the second power, ending up with n being 1,600 repetitions. So the answer to this question is B. Next and last question. Any time the number of sweeps is increased by 1,600 sweeps, the signal-to-noise ratio becomes twice as good. A true, B false. In the same paper from which I used the example, there is a tracing which I have included here on the top right side of the screen. This tracing presented was or was introduced after 32 repetitions, which has improved the signal to noise ratio by 5.7. Then the example shows a second tracing after 128 sweeps, a further improve of the signal to noise ratio of 11.4 has been obtained by this degree of repetitions. A third tracing after 1024 repetition is presented in which there is an improvement of the record that is of the signal to noise ratio by 32. So the signal to noise ratio improved two times going from 5.7 to 11.4 with 96 sweeps initially. But it took 896 sweeps more to improve the signal to noise ratio by 2.8 times. So the degree to which the signal improves does not increase linearly with the number of repetition and in addition it is important to remember that the mathematical form formula we have just seen assumes that the signal is perfectly uncorrelated to the noise, something that is not always true in nature. Nevertheless, this table I am listing at the moment, you can see that I have placed the number of repetitions to your left. In a middle column, I have placed the signal to noise improvement accomplished by the number of repetitions. And in your far right corner, I have used the improvement in dB because sometimes this is the way that they are given in the exam. In this new populated column I have listed the added sweeps needed to go from one number of sweeps to the other. As you can see the numbers are progressively bigger. And in the last column to be filled I have 
populated it with the relative improvement which occurred by going from one number of sweeps to the next. I will give you an example that hopefully will make it easier to understand. As you can see, going from 4096 repetition to 16,348 repetitions takes 12,288 additional sweeps. And by doing so, we have made the signal to noise ratio only twice as good. The same degree of improvement that is twice as good can be achieved by getting 192 sweeps when going from 64 sweeps to 256 sweeps. So the bottom line is that increasing the number of repetition to improve the signal to noise ratio beyond a certain point does not make sense. So the answer to this question is B. Thank you. This concludes the first part of intraoperative somatosensory evoked potentials. The second part will be coming soon.